Sunday. This morning up here, we're talking about how we all see the world. And I think a lot of people assume that how they see the world is how everybody else sees it. Like when they look at a color or when they look at a picture, everybody else sees it just like they see things. But the fact is, we all have different eyes. We have different color receptors and brains that pick up details different than others. I learned this clearly in my last job. I am green deficient. Many men actually have much more higher chance of having color blindness in various ways. So I don't see green unless it's a little more poppy than what the average person sees. So I picked a nice pale green for my office. I find that calming. It's my favorite color. For the next eight years, every person who visited me in that office who hadn't been there would walk in and go, wow, this is a green office. And I was like, really? It's just a nice pale shade of green. But apparently, it was a lot. I learned that the hard way. Another example of how people look at images differently are those pictures that maybe you've seen where there's the what's in the white space and what's in the dark space make up two different images. For instance, we've got this first one uh, to put up on the screen. Now, raise your hand if you see a tree. Okay, raise your hand if you see the monkey and the animal. Okay, can most of you see both? But do you notice you kind of have to flip your brain from looking for one to looking for the other? Like, I don't, when I look at it, I don't see both at the same time. I kind of have to flip back and forth, choosing, am I looking for the dark space or am I looking for the white space? Another famous drawing is this next one. It depicts an old, grizzled, haggard woman and a young, beautiful woman wearing a fur. Raise your hand if you see the older woman. Not quite as many hands. Raise your hand if you see the younger woman looking away. More hands. Okay. Now in this picture, as I kind of flip my mind back and forth, it's kind of like either I'm looking at like beauty or I'm looking at misery. Both of them are in the image. It's just how I choose to look at this image. And I think that that applies a lot to the world today, right? We can all come to the same event or look at the same series of events, and some see the beauty and some see the misery, and it's all kind of which perspective that you're going to take. So today, we're looking at our third tool that we have been given for fighting against anxiety. And if you're a person, you're a warrior, maybe this is your first time here and you're like, ooh, a series on anxiety. I encourage you, go back, check us out. We've been doing this series now for four weeks. We've been talking about how to fight against anxiety in your mind, which is crippling to so many people nowadays. You can find that on our Facebook page or YouTube or our website, firstbaptistsheridan.com. But we're looking today at how we can attack our anxiety by filtering our thinking. Okay, we need to filter our sights, the memories we have, the ideas that come to our minds. You see, two different people can walk through the same traumatic event, but one might process it in one way where all they see is all the terrible things and they're always thinking about it and they live their lives going forward always always in fear. And another person can go through it and how they process that event through their mind, how they filter it, allows them to have a much healthier way of going through life in the future. Unfortunately, I think this occurs in marriage all too often. As husbands, without thinking, might say statements that they or ask questions that are completely benign in their minds, like, are you wearing that shirt to the party tonight? And in that statement, the woman hears all sorts of accusation and shame, and tying that to what maybe somebody said about a shirt she wore to a party years earlier. And so all of a sudden she's like, well, what's wrong with this shirt? And the husband's like, I just wanted to know if that's the color you were wearing. I'm getting dressed. Like, you know, but we jump to these conclusions. We filter a simple question, and the woman filters it different than the husband, and that's what often leads to the miscommunications. Now, before we jump in further, this concept of filtering our thinking, we have to say, well, what is the job of a filter? A filter's job is to catch all the junk from passing through before it is able to contaminate everything else that is good. The problem with many people who have anxiety and depression is that their mental filter is catching the wrong thoughts. 
It's catching the junk and it's holding on to it and saying, yes, think about this, ruminate about this, worry about this some more. And all the good things, the kind word that somebody said or the blessing that somebody did or the beautiful weather, you don't see any of that. All God's blessings, you see none of it. And all you see are dark clouds and hurtful statements because your filter is catching the wrong things and letting the, the right things pass right on by. As a result, many anxious people just continue to get more and more anxious because their anxiety attunes their brain to look for threats. And when you're looking for threats, you're going to find more threats. And so the world becomes a more and more dangerous place. And it's much worse than how other people might see it. And that often leads to depression because if you're constantly seeing then the bad in life and that's all you see, it leads you to a place where you feel hopeless. You feel despair. If all you're looking for is bad and all you're finding is bad, then the entire world must be bad. And that leaves you in a really dark place. And so this catch-22 spiral of doom is really part of the human condition. And I think it always has been. The difference is, nowadays, it, with our cultural epidemic of anxiety, it's more prevalent because we have so much more information coming at us. And so if your thought filter isn't working, it's really easy to turn on the news, to go to social media, to have a conversation with somebody. I mean, look at how politics is just so divisive right now. You can't have a conversation without feeling spurned on to anger that the other side is so wrong and it just makes you angry and it grips your chest. And so with all this constant barrage of information, I think people are filtering it wrong and so anxiety is growing, depression is growing as a result. The simplest and most direct advice that we are given in the Word of God in how to focus on uh, to how to fight against this focus of the bad and instead filtering out the good is from Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. I love Proverbs. There's a million things in there that are worth memorizing. Um, we're going to look at today chapter 4, verse 23. It says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. That word for heart in the Hebrew is kind of like your will. Your thinking, your thoughts, everything that makes you you, you need to guard that. You need to protect that. You need to filter that. Because what goes in there is ultimately going to drive everything else. It's all going to flow out of you. Your actions and behaviors, your anxiety is going to grow based on what thoughts you allow to percolate in your mind. Now, some people might argue, but Ryan, everything in this world is awful. Have you not watched the news? It really is terrible. And I would say, if you feel that way, then you need to understand, you may be experiencing a bit of what's called cognitive distortion. And that simply means you've gotten to a place where all you can see is the bad. You're simply accepting the lie that everything is bad. Here's the truth. If you have electricity running water that's safe to drink, refrigeration, the internet, the ability to read, you are better off than 99.9% .9 of society up to this point in all of human history. Like, you have to understand, you still have a lot going for you. You have the ability to get a job. You have the ability to make money. You have the ability to be connected with people. Um, life isn't all completely awful. You have to fight against swallowing that lie. Scripture tells us that this tool to fight against anxiety, it's going to take some self-discipline as it entails taking control of your own thought life. You know, as we've looked at these three things that God gives us to deal with our anxiety, the first one was we turn to him in worship and we say, God, I celebrate you. I worship you. In all this junk that's going on in my mind, I'm going to put my mind on you, make you bigger so that my problems get smaller. The second one was prayer. We said we, just, we need to toss these thoughts over the wall to God and say, you're the one who can deal with it, so you deal with it, not me. But this one's a little different because this takes some self-discipline to say, you know what? This isn't between me and God. This is I have to decide what am I going to think about? What am I going to allow to sit in my mind? What am I going to ruminate on over and over? 
Well, I sit and think about how mad that person has made me and think of 20 different conversations that I should have to let them know how they wronged me. Because we all know, we've probably all done that. It doesn't help you. At the end of the day, you're more anxious, you're more angry, upset. You have to focus on what you're going to do. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, Paul writes, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. We take captive every thought. We have to identify, is that a thought worth keeping? Or do I need to filter it out? Is this in alignment with the knowledge of God? Or is this garbage that the world is throwing at me? Is this a lie that Satan is trying to seat into my heart? If your thoughts dictate your actions, then it's imperative that you filter through your thinking and put it through the filter of the lens of Jesus Christ. You have to recognize what's unhelpful to you and, act, and those thoughts that actually increase your anxiety and instead put your mind on those thoughts that are a benefit to you that help tune you into the truth of God. So our job today is to understand how are we supposed to filter our experiences, our beliefs, and our surroundings in this life. We have to decide how do we differentiate what's worthless and we need to let it go and what is we're actually supposed to spend more time pondering and holding on to. So, the instructions in the next part of this passage that we've been unpacking, we've been going through this series now in Philippians chapter 4. In verse 8, it says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Here Paul continues to tell us how we experience the peace of God. That's this whole passage from Philippians 4.4 4 through 4.9. It's all about how we experience that peace that comes from him. And he says we need to focus on what's true, noble, right, lovely, admirable. Put those things in your mind. That's where peace is going to come from. A quick side note. This is not name it and claim it theology, okay? I know some people are like, you know, I just need to think about the world that I want to inhabit and then God will give it to me. And if I'm feeling a little bit sick, I can't say I'm feeling sick because then I'm going to speak that into existence. That's doing incantations, okay? I know there are Christians on that side of the fence. I'm not there, okay? But there is something to this, what Scripture does tell us. We have to think about What's going on in our minds? And we do have to take every thought captive. But you don't have the power if you say, oh, I'm feeling sick today. You didn't just speak it into existence. That's incantations. That's not scriptural. Having said all that now, let's look at how we are to filter our thoughts and bring them into alignment with God. First, you have to filter your experiences, we said. You have to decide what Uh, experiences from your past you're going to remember and how you're going to remember them. We have to understand each of us are shaped by our past. We're shaped by our history, perhaps by trauma, by difficulties, and by good things. Maybe you came from a healthy family with a great family dynamic. You were involved in a local church and it created a model for how you should live. So it's really easy for you to hold on to that and say, this is lovely, this is pure, this is right, and this is how I want to live. But there's others of you, you didn't come from that family. You came from hurt. You came from anger. You came from jealousy. And there is adultery and broken marriage and all that stuff. And it's easy to sit in the victim mode and say, but I saw all of this. I saw people who were never faithful to one another or to me. And so I don't trust anybody. And you filter all your experiences through the lens of brokenness and unfaithfulness and how people are going to wrong you. So you're looking for those things to happen to you again as you go through life walking forward. And so in every new situation, those types of people can be looking for danger and threats. 
because that's what their past is. They're holding on to that. And they begin to be, believe that that's just their lot in life. Yet no matter the hardships that you've gone through, you have the opportunity to choose how you're going to remember those experiences. And yes, there were people who failed you in all sorts of ways. All of us have that. But we also have a God who's probably been faithful to you in an assortment of ways. And you have to decide, am I going to focus on all the people who have hurt me, or am I going to focus on my God who has been faithful, who walked through this with me, who comforted me, who put that one person in my life who was so helpful and helped me get through that difficult time. Like when you recognize that there's a God who loves you and knows you and was there even through the hardships, then instead of saying, I'm going to go through junk again, you say, even if I have bad stuff happen, I'm going to have my faithful God walk through it with me. Do you see how that completely changes your fear for the future in how you reframe even your difficult past experiences? Next, you must decide how you're going to filter through the truth and untruth that try to take a foothold in your heart. What beliefs is your heart going to hold on to? And then from those beliefs, you have to decide that you're going to filter out the lies of Satan. We already talked about that in the first message here, how Satan is ultimately the master of deception. He's the father of lies. But he's not the master of your mind. He doesn't get to decide what you hold on to. He can throw his flaming darts, as Peter tells us, as many of those lies at you as he wants. But ultimately, you're the one who decides which of those stick. You're the one who can block those out, who can allow the peace of Christ to guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus, right? And to say, I will not receive these lies. And a quick recap from week, from week one. Satan's lies are that uh, Christians should never struggle. If you do, it means you must not love God enough or you don't matter to God. Those are lies. Another lie is that you are crazy. You're losing it. Something's wrong with you. That's not true. A lot of people are struggling right now. It's okay to not be okay. Okay? Number three, you are all alone. Nobody cares. Nobody's going to help. Nobody can relate. That's a lie. There are many people who want to help you. That's what we're going to talk about next week. And there's a God who's walking through this right beside you. And finally, the worst lie that leaves you feeling completely hopeless is this will never end. This is your lot in life, so you're just going to have to deal with it. Those are all the lies from the pit of Satan. Instead, the Bible tells us to hold on to and to never forget the benefits that come from God. Psalm 103, verses 2 through 5. David writes, Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. He's saying, remember these things. Hold on to what I'm about to write. These are the things that are going to encourage you when you step out into the future and into difficulty. Forget not his benefits, who forgives all your sins. Even when you sin again, he's a God who forgives. He heals all your diseases. Even if your disease takes you through this life, you will experience healing in the next who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. That's just the psalmist saying, these are the benefits I see and I want to never let go of these things. And we as Christians are to hold on to the promises of God. We can tune our minds, not to the lies of the enemy, but to the good things that God promises us in his word. These are the promises, a short list, it's not even all of them, that we see in scripture. God promises that I am loved, I am valued, I am accepted, I am chosen, I am called, I am safe, I am protected. God never leaves me. God will strengthen me. God will guide me. God will empower me. God's spirit lives in me. I am more than a conqueror. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Nothing is impossible for God. 
God has a plan, even if I can't see it, and I will be victorious. There's a lot of promises there. I was going through that, and I thought, that's powerful. So I took the time to type it up. You're welcome. It took me a long time. And then I had to look for typos, and it was too late to have anybody edit it. So we've got a sheet, Promises of God. It's 20 promises and the Bible verse that goes with each and every one of those. They're right next to the offering plate on your way out. Grab one of these. Put it in your Bible. If you're struggling with anxiety, read through this every morning. Remind yourself who you are in Christ. Remind yourself that you're not a loser who nobody likes, who can't do anything right, but that you're loved, you're valued, and God has your back. Grab that. Put it somewhere where you're going to see it over and over and over. And let that thinking retrain you to see the beauty, the lovely, the truthful things of God that line up with his word. Finally, you must learn to filter out what your ears and your eyes perceive the world that you encounter. You may not be in control of everything around you, but you actually have a lot more control than you might think. You simply have to be intentional to decide that you're going to filter out what you allow your ears and your eyes to perceive, what you watch, what you listen to, what you interact with. You see, the world offers us a very twisted image of God's Good creation. Genesis 1, everything was good. It was beautiful. It was excellent. Genesis 2, Adam and Eve, their relationship is perfect. Genesis 3, it falls apart. Evil and darkness begin to reign in this world. And now most of our entertainment focuses on the evil, the darkness, the twistedness, the sinfulness. We look at the news cycle, it focuses on the brokenness. We look at social media, and it's just a whole bunch of news and memes and jokes that don't really line up with the beauty and the excellence that God originally intended for his good creation. And so, and it's not just the media that we surround ourselves with. That's a whole bunch of that we have to choose. What am I going to do with that? What am I going to filter? Am I going to say, you know what, I need to stop letting that into my mind. It's not helping me with my anxiety. It's not helping me with my depression. I've heard of some people, there was a study, they had teenage or college students stop watching the news for three weeks and stop doing social media. And after just three weeks, they reported better uh, mental health than the people who just continued in their daily routines. That stuff matters. But it's not just the media that you let in. It's also the people you surround yourself with. You know, some of you have negative Nancys in your life. Uh, Debbie Downer, like everything they say is just dark and dreadful. Or maybe they're just mean and they always have just a sharpness to their words. They're very sarcastic. And everything is just kind of hurtful. And you need to say, is that a person that's worth spending my time with? Or is that actually creating that angst inside of me? And you have to choose. Who are you going to be around? There's other people that are light and lovely and beautiful in how they treat you and act and behave. And their words are always seasoned in a way that you're like, I just love being around that person. That's what's beautiful and excellent. Then spend more time with that person and less time with the person who brings you down. That negativity rubs off. And if you surround yourself by everything negative then that's what your mind's going to start filtering for. But that means you have to make some hard choices. You have to decide, there's going to be music I'm going to stop listening to. There's going to be radio stations I'm going to not have programmed on the car anymore. I'm going to not go to Facebook because you know what? It's just not helpful or whatever it is. And I know it sounds like a big ask, but if anxiety is suffocating you, what are you willing to do to break out of it? I know so many teenagers are just entrapped in their anxiety, but when you're like, have you prayed? Have you worshipped? Have you, you know, stopped looking at these things that are causing all sorts of comparison inside you? They're like, well, no, I have to do those things. No, you have to fight against the anxiety. You have to take a stand. And by God's help and in God's strength, He can help you do that, but you've got to take those steps for yourself. Uh... Last thing I wanted to say on that, it's hard for me to ultimately name 
all the things that are beautiful and excellent that you should be spending time with. I can't give you a, here's a list of what you should do more of. But here's what I believe. If you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, and you're thinking, okay, I want to filter for evil and darkness on this side. It's out. Beautiful and excellent is in. You'll know it when you see it. If you're like, I'm not sure about this thing, take a moment, think about it, and you'll know, "Ah, I probably shouldn't. That probably needs to get cut. Or, you know what? This, it may not be overtly Christian, but there's nothing wrong with it. So you know what? I'm going to let that in. That's okay. That's beautiful. It's excellent. And I'm going to have that be a part of my life. Okay. Honestly, everything we've talked about to this point is, would be widely accepted by, in most therapeutic circles. Did you know that? This whole idea of filtering your thoughts and pushing out the bad and letting in the good. I did some Googling. There's all sorts of therapists, counselors, Christian, non-Christian, who say this is helpful for anxiety. Here's where this message becomes overtly Christian. If you are going to put a filter in your mind, ultimately, it's up to you to decide what that filter is going to be. And just like I said, every person sees the world differently. Every person who's told you need to filter your thoughts, they're going to build a filter differently than how other people are going to. They're going to allow different things in or block different things than what the next person is. What makes the gospel message, what makes this message Christian is we say, we don't get to decide the filter for ourselves. The filter is defined for us. The filter is Jesus. Like, you don't get to say, well, I decide what's good and I decide what's bad. We say, Jesus is the filter. If it lines up with him and his teaching, if it lines up with what he came to this world to do, then we know that it is about God's faithfulness. It is about God's promises. It is about beauty and excellence. It is the good. And so we have a very simple shorthand way of saying what's in and what's out and does it align with Jesus? He tells us in John chapter 15, abide in me. This is some super easy way to build that filter is to say connect to Christ, cling to him. As the more you know about who Jesus is, the more you pray and connect with him, the more he's going to help you refine your thinking so that you know what to hold on to and what to push out. It becomes very simple. It's not up to us to decide for ourselves. It's up to us to listen for the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us in this practice. I want to end with one final passage written by Paul who also wrote Philippians, our main passage, and I think it ties together so much of what we've been discussing today and in these past few weeks. He writes, And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Remember we talked about that. That's a huge part of our prayerfulness is in thanksgiving. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, By letting the word of God in, that's how we build that filter. Teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. That's where we're going next week. Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual psalms. That's that act of worship where peace flows out of. With thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. In all that you do, it's about Jesus. It's allowing him to filter how you think, which then changes and impacts how you act. And that's where the peace that all of us want and that God wants for each one of us comes from. Boiling this message down to its simplest form, if you want to battle against anxiety, you need to cling to Christ. You need to abide in him, and in doing so, you'll filter everything through the lens of Jesus. You're going to see that he is your rock and refuge who has helped you in your past experiences. He's your hope for the future and your strength to face everything new in life's challenges. He's the very definition of creator and creator of beauty and excellence. He is 
what's going to allow you to recognize what to keep in and what to push out. This week, I read one phrase that really stuck with me. It was, where your mind lingers, feelings grow. And so often for anxious people, their mind lingers on what's wrong. And so their feelings are heightened. Their anxiety grows. Their anger towards somebody who's hurt them just expands. And in this message, we're saying, cling to Christ. Let your mind linger on the things of God, on what's beautiful, on what's excellent. And as you do that, your love for Christ is going to grow. Your love for God and the way that he wants to work in you and through you and the plan he has for your life and the opportunities you have to make a difference in other people's lives, that's going to grow inside of you. Your appreciation for that, for seeing that God wants to be a part of your life. He wants to give you all the peace and say, you know what, there's no pressure on you to perform. There's nothing but grace and mercy for your life. Hold on to me and just... Live as a child of God in the love that I offered to you. And if you can do that, if you can let go of the negative thoughts and say, God, I just want to cling to you, then that peace that he promises can be yours. Where your mind lingers, your feelings grow. Would you bow with me? Bow your heads with me as we pray.